Let's uh, begin with some corporate prayer together. Prayer is, again, the place where our needs, and we have plenty of needs, right? Where our needs get connected with God's promises. When we, when we pray together, that's what's happening. And as, as I pray together, as people come to your mind that have entrusted themselves to your prayers, you know, people say, hey, pray for me. That's a good time when I'm praying through different categories to just offer their name up to God. And as he brings them to your mind, we will heap all of our prayers together up to him. So let's pray together. Father, what a gift that we can come to you, a living God who has promised to hear us and who loves and delights in our requests. Lord, you are far more aware of our needs than we are, and you have far more resources to meet our needs than we could imagine. Lord, we know there are many among us this morning who need healing. And so, Father, we pray for healing. There are those among us who need comfort. Lord, we pray for comfort for them. Lord, there are those this morning who need connection. We pray, Lord, for connection for them. Father, there are people in our life, and maybe even each one of us, who need to experience your tangible living presence. Would you help us to do that? And Lord, there are families and relationships that need peace. We pray for that. We pray for peace in our world, for peace in Ukraine. In all places, Lord, where there is not right now. We pray, pray for the advance of the gospel in our community, in our relationships, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. Lord, that your kingdom would grow in advance there. We pray for abundant life, homeless shelter. Lord, for your hand of blessing and provision upon each leader there, upon each person who finds themselves in need of housing. We pray for a mighty move of your hand there. And we pray, Lord, for brothers and sisters this morning that we know who need to work this morning. They are at work. They aren't able to join us in worship. We pray that you would give them your comfort. They would know you this morning and experience you even as they work. For each one of us, Lord, our discipleship to Jesus, we want to grow to be more like him. Father, would you cause growth in each one of us? And Lord, then for this morning, for each one of our hearts, Lord, would you make our hearts receptive to your word? Would you help us to receive what it is that you would like to say to us through your word? Remove all distractions from our mind, from our life, Lord, that we could focus upon you together. Thank you, Lord, that this is all possible only through Jesus, through his work, his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension, and we pray that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit that he pours out. We pray together in his name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them or tap to them to the book of Acts, chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We have a lively passage this morning full of intriguing characters and tangible power of God's Spirit. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hope you're ready. Are you ready? Okay. So as we come to Acts 8, we again will see that the kingdom of God is coming into conflict with the kingdom of darkness and evil. This conflict is going to continue to happen in Acts as the gospel advances. And as we've seen so far through Acts, the advance of the kingdom of God will not be stopped. It will not be stopped in the face of any opposition. Jesus' movement will continue to grow and move forward. Let's begin with the first three verses of Acts chapter 8. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, 
except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. These verses set the scene of our passage. Every single detail that Luke has in here matters. He wants us to see all of it. On the very day that Stephen was martyred, great persecution began. We heard about Stephen last week. If you missed that sermon, it's available on our website. I would encourage you to go back and take some time and listen to it. But the day that Stephen was killed for his faith in Jesus, this great opposition and brutal house-to-house persecution begins for the followers of Jesus in Jerusalem. This was, again, in another attempt to snuff them out, to stop once and for all what Jesus had started in them. They were a threat to the status quo in all that had been built before them. This was led by Saul. We get that right at the end of this passage. Saul, who would then later become the Apostle Paul and a follower of Jesus, was the one going house to house in this brutal way. Now, this was a real marked escalation of the persecution. Remember, a few weeks ago, the religious leaders were debating among themselves, what do we do with this group? And they came to this conclusion, well, we've already killed their Lord on a cross. We can just leave this movement and it will fizzle out on its own. But it didn't. And in the end, we'll see today that this new brutal attempt to stop the advance of the gospel of Jesus and his kingdom would also fail. What was intended for evil, God would use for good. At the very beginning of Acts, chapter 1, the resurrected Jesus, before he ascended to heaven in Acts 1, verse 8, said this. He made this promise. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And you might remember as well that at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gave his apostles, his followers, the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. But how would they do this? What was the plan? The strategy to spread the good news of Jesus to the end of the earth, to every inhabitable place. Persecution and scattering, that was the plan. God chose to use the evil of persecution and the scattering and the spreading out of God's people that resulted from it as the catalyst, as the spark for more and more people to hear the good news of Jesus and experience his healing, to experience inclusion in the family of God in his kingdom. Jesus made that available to anyone and everyone who would come to him. And this is what we see again and again throughout the book of Acts. Evil and darkness makes a move to put to stop, to end what Jesus is doing. And God takes that and ends up using evil as an instrument to give his people a deeper faith in Jesus, a deeper connection with him, and to bring about this situation in which more and more people hear about Jesus. The very thing that is meant to stop what Jesus is doing ends up being used as an instrument to advance it over and over again. And this is how it is today. This is how it still is in our world today. We do not need to fear the schemes of the evil one to bring to nothing what Jesus began. God is not wringing his hands. He is not worried about being outmaneuvered or overpowered by any opposition. The very things that we can fear the most are often the very things that God uses to bring about his good plan for us and for his good creation. The story continues Verse 4, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. 
when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. The scattered ones now continued to do what they had been doing in Jerusalem. They gossip the gospel constantly. As they go about living, doing their lives, trying to adjust to where they now were, you can imagine what that would have been like as a family to find a new home. As they did that, they didn't stop sharing the good news of Jesus. And now we're introduced to Philip, one of these scattered ones. He was like Stephen, one of the seven who was chosen to serve in Acts chapter 6. We heard about that maybe six weeks ago now. He was chosen because a complaint had arose among the widows of the Hellenists when they distributed food for what people needed. The complaint was that these widows were being overlooked. So Stephen and now Philip were some of the seven who were put in place with administrative gifts who could resolve this situation and make sure people who were in need could be fed. Philip, too, was a Hellenist just like the widows who were being overlooked. Remember, a Hellenist was a Greek-speaking Jew from outside of Palestine, as opposed to an Aramaic-speaking Jew who lived in Palestine. We'll see as, in addition to possessing wise administrative gifts, he had some sort of evangelistic gift as well. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 is a really big deal. Philip went down to Samaria and proclaimed Christ. This is the first time in our biblical record after the crucifixion and resurrection that the gospel was proclaimed by Jesus' followers outside of Jerusalem. And it wasn't just that location outside Jerusalem that was a big deal. It It was that Philip was proclaiming the gospel among Samaritans. The Samaritans and Jews had a long history of disagreement and separation. They weren't together. They had been at odds for a thousand years at this point. Listen to what one historian I found this week wrote about this dynamic. He said the Samaritans were despised by the Jews as hybrids in both race and religion, as both heretics and schismatics. So they were an excluded people. They were not viewed as full members of God's people and his family. Philip was doing something new by going to them, but it was something that they had seen modeled in Jesus. Jesus, on several occasions, had shocked his followers by his interactions with Samaritans or by using Samaritans as key people in one of his stories, one of his parables. You might remember the famous parable, The Good Samaritan, right, where a Samaritan selflessly loves and cares for a Jewish man who had been robbed and left for dead. When Jesus told that story, it shocked people. Or you might remember the encounter that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus, in order to share with her who he was and the life that he could bring her, asked her for a drink of water. And she responded in John 4, 9, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And then John gives us a little comment at the end of that quote, For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Philip, being a Hellenist, would have probably had some experience, some sense of what it would have been like to be on the outside, although it wouldn't have been nearly to the degree that Samaritans would have felt on the outside. What happened? What happened when Philip shared this good news? They paid attention. They paid attention to what he was saying and powerful signs accompanied the message that he proclaimed. The message and manifestation of the Holy Spirit's power went together. This is again exactly what it looked like when Jesus was on earth proclaiming the kingdom of God. There was message and there was manifestation of God's kingdom, of his power. Evil spirits were forced to leave people who had been demonized by them and dehumanized by them. Others with ailments that had no cure and no hope for change in their life were healed. And the result is so beautiful. Luke records that it was a city full of joy. 
As God moved and worked among these Samaritans, they were moved to joy. Let's continue with verse 9. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. So Luke introduces us to this character, Simon, the magician. Simon had for a long time, did you catch that detail? He had been doing this for a long time. He didn't just dabble. This was what he did. Been amazing people with some sort of magic, some sort of power. And like Philip, Simon had a message that was accompanied by this power. He had a message, a manifestation like Philip. Simon shared the good news of his own greatness. Philip shared the good news of Jesus and his kingdom. Simon's news was self-referential. It was all about him. Philip's news was of the living God, a crucified, resurrected, and ascended king whose reign would never come to an end. Simon was a big deal in Simon's mind. Jesus was the big deal in Philip's mind. Yet after hearing the message proclaimed, Luke records that even Simon believed and was amazed by the power of the Holy Spirit that he encountered. God was doing things through Philip that even amazed this magician, probably because Simon had no power to do what he saw Philip doing. Think about it. If Simon had been able to cast out evil spirits and heal people of these hopeless ailments, wouldn't he have done so already? The people believed the good news that Philip proclaimed about the kingdom of God and about Jesus, and they were baptized. In their baptism, they were identified with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. They died to their old way of life, their old life, and they were raised to new life in him. And even Simon participated in this baptism, at least outwardly. We'll see short, shortly, though, that his heart was not right, that he was still seeking to make himself the focal point of everything. But I don't want us to miss this. The central figure of Acts continues to be the living God. You can see it's Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit, it's the Father who are the initiators, who are the actors, who are the ones that are bringing this all forward. They are the central actors. Philip is not the main character either. He just participates in what the main character, God, is doing. He is a servant. Let's continue with verse 14. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Samaritans heard the good news. They responded to it with faith and baptism in Jesus. This was a huge deal. Such a huge deal, in fact, that two apostles, Peter and John, are dispatched to investigate what had happened from Jerusalem. Something peculiar, though, was going on. Something irregular was happening in Samaria because the people had not yet received the Holy Spirit in the same way that others in Jerusalem had when they believed in Jesus. What was going on? Had the Samaritans believed in Jesus or not? Had Philip proclaimed another gospel or maybe an incomplete gospel? That's what those apostles were there to investigate, to see for themselves what was happening. Evidently, there was nothing wrong with the Samaritans at all. Their faith in Jesus or the message that Philip had powerfully proclaimed to them God was doing something unique because something other, utterly unique was happening 
in their midst, something that had never happened before. Non-Jews outside of Jerusalem who had always been on the outside and always excluded were being included as full members of the family of God, lacking nothing. God, in his love and in his wisdom, chose this unique two-stage initiation into the family of God for them so that it would be clear to the Samaritans in Samaria and to the apostles in Jerusalem that they were to be one people together. No more of this separation. No more of this animosity and arguing over where do we worship and who's really in. Samaritans, like Jews, could be recipients of the eternal kind of life through faith in Jesus. The apostles laid their hands on them, having believed, having been baptized, they received the Holy Spirit. Luke doesn't tell us how they knew exactly that they had received the Spirit by looking at them, but it must have been something external, something that was a manifestation of the Spirit's power so that there could be no doubt that these Samaritans had now the Holy Spirit. It might have been tongues like we had seen earlier in Acts, speaking in other languages. It might have been some prophetic gift. Whatever it was, they all knew for certain the Holy Spirit was now on Samaritans. This two-stage initiation was unique. It is not the way that God ordinarily chooses to bring people into his family. Presumably, since Peter and John leave and go back to Jerusalem, Going forward, their presence wouldn't have been required in Samaria for people to receive the Spirit in the same way because they left. The ordinary single-stage initiation where a person believes in Christ and is filled with the Spirit all at once would become the normal way in Samaria, just like it had been in Jerusalem for them as they proclaimed the gospel there. Listen to how the Apostle Paul taught about belonging to Christ and being indwelled by the Spirit as inseparable. Romans 8, 9. Paul said, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. The Spirit and faith in Christ go hand in hand. With his Spirit poured out obviously and fully upon the Samaritans, God firmly established an important reality for his people. The good news of the kingdom and Jesus Christ is meant for everyone, for all people. No one is to be left out of the good news. Anyone and everyone who would respond to the good news of Jesus with faith is included as a full member of God's family without qualification. There are to be no first, second, or third class citizens in the kingdom of heaven. All who come to him in faith become his sons and daughters, full members of his family. The kingdom of God makes possible the inclusion of everyone who had been excluded. We human beings are good at coming up with all sorts of reasons for keeping someone on the outside. It happens from such a young age, too. Even in the earliest years, kids start to select certain other kids who don't fit They can be excluded in some way. The way a person looks, the way a person acts, the way a person interacts, what they're interested in, what color of fabric and brand that they wear. These are all ways that human beings pick to exclude and to reject. And ultimately, this exclusion and the way that it plays out dehumanizes the person who's being excluded. And once the person is dehumanized, the way they are treated is less than human. That's what happens whenever people are excluded. I wonder for us, the places that we live, the places that we work, who are those who are excluded and considered less in some way? Who is it that is always alone at lunch? or when people are gathered? Who's overlooked 
by the world in your life. And I'm not talking theoretically or even hypothetically, but very specifically, who are the marginalized in your life? Whoever's name or face is coming to your mind, he or she is someone created by God to know him, to know the good news of Jesus and his kingdom and all that comes with that. And God has chosen to put you near that person, that you would be a sort of Philip to them. It's amazing. Let's continue on with verse 18. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Simon, buddy, what in the world? What were you thinking? The gift of God cannot be purchased with money. It cannot. For Simon, this attempt at buying spiritual authority revealed that while he had in some way responded to the good news that he had heard preached, he was still oriented upon his own greatness. He wanted influence and power and prestige and honor that in his mind would come from being able to do what he saw the apostles do. The Holy Spirit would be a means to building Simon's kingdom. What emptiness this is. Unfortunately, Simon wasn't the last one to do this, was he? We actually have a word now, simony, after Simon, which means to buy or sell spiritual offices, roles, or sacred things. It's a way of attempting to really actually achieve some sort of worldly reward through using spiritual means. The Apostle Peter's rebuke is direct and really clear. Simon's heart was not right before God. He was not on the path of life, but on the path of of death. And that clarity and that specificity is what needs to happen any and every time something like this is attempted in the church. There can be no tolerance of it. Serving in Jesus' name is about Jesus and his name being great, not the servant's name being great, ever. The kingdom of God already has a king who died and rose again. His reign will never come to an end. He does not need any help, and he will not tolerate any competitors to his reign. Whenever a human being assumes the position of God, or whenever a human being assumes the functional position of God in another person's life, darkness, brokenness, sin, and suffering are not far behind. That's what happens. Whenever a human being takes on the role they were not meant for in another person's life, it brings sin and suffering. Church, we need to be on guard against this. Manipulation for selfish gain. Pride and personal influence. Building a kingdom that isn't about the king. And each one of us needs to start with our own hearts because each one of us is capable of making this about ourselves. When we see or sense the seed and the seeds of Simon's way in our hearts, we need to follow Peter's directions. The way forward starts by turning around, repenting. And we need to go to God and ask for forgiveness, that he would give us clean hearts. And we also need to confess to each other. We need to bring the darkness into light that Christ would shine on it. We can't let it fester. There's one more thing I want to highlight in this section. Notice that when Peter and John leave, they don't go directly back to Jerusalem. 
They don't just take the quickest, shortest route back. The way Luke describes their journey, it sounds like they intentionally visited as many Samaritan villages as they could on the way back and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus. Again, this evil of persecution and scattering, God is using it for good and for joy for people who would have never heard if God hadn't pushed them out in this way. The story isn't over yet, though. Let's continue in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south on the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. God continues to direct Philip's steps and Philip continues to obey him. He walks south, finds himself in the desert, no one around, and a chariot comes along, an important Ethiopian's chariot. And then he's directed again by the spirit, go, go up to this chariot. All the details, again, that Luke gives us here that he chose to record really do matter and they make this story come to life. He wants us to know that this man was an Ethiopian. That's a a black African man. That he was a eunuch. So he wouldn't have had a family of his own. And he had no prospect for a family of his own. This man had a really big job overseeing all the queen's treasure that he had traveled all the way to Jerusalem to worship. So he was in some way God-fearing. He desired God. He desired to worship God. Yet he would most likely not have been a full convert to Judaism. And he certainly would not have been allowed in the inner courts of the temple because of his condition as a eunuch. He would have been excluded. He was an outsider again. And this outsider had a hunger for God, and God intervened so that he could know him, so that he could experience the healing and life of Jesus. Let's continue, verse 30. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began with his, this scripture. He told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water. Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself as at Azotus. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Wow. So Philip runs up to catch this chariot in the desert. Presumably there's like no one else around, right? There's no reason to be there. He hears him reading. It would have been common just to be reading out loud. And he expresses amazing love and concern for this man. Look what he did. He asks him a question. That's his first interaction. He just asks him a question. Philip didn't need to pick up a megaphone for the truth and blast him with it. Just says, do you understand what you're reading? That was a question of love that then presumably he listened listened enough and with eagerness that this Ethiopian invites him up into the chariot. 
the Ethiopian man, I really, I wish we knew his name, but we don't, had been reading Isaiah 53, which is all about Jesus and how he would lay down his life for the sins of his people. We don't have time to open Isaiah 53 this morning and dig into it, but if you're taking notes, write Isaiah 53 down and maybe later today take a look at it. I remember the first time I gave it a serious reading in my early 20s, I could not believe what I saw in Isaiah 53, something written hundreds of years before Jesus was ever on earth. It's so vivid and so specific describing exactly what ends up happening in Jesus. When I read it originally, because of my wiring, I actually was skeptical of whether or not that could have actually been what was meant to say, so I went and found a Jewish Old Testament to find out, did our Christian translations maybe tidy it up to make it a bit more about Jesus? No, they didn't tidy it up. The Jewish Old Testament I found read the same way. Isaiah 53 is an unbelievably vivid description of the death and suffering of Christ for his people. And that's what this Ethiopian man was reading as Philip walked up. They read it together. Philip begins explaining Isaiah 53 and Jesus to him and shares the gospel with him. And then, remember the scene. They're in the desert. The chariot's kind of rolling along. Suddenly, there's water. There's not normally water in the desert, right? That's why it's a desert. So the man requests, baptize me. They get out of the chariot, and Philip baptizes him. This Ethiopian man becomes a full member of the family of God. Through Jesus, he was no longer an outsider. He now belonged. He was a son of God, purchased by God as his own. He belonged to a loving heavenly father now. Like the Samaritans coming to faith, this was a significant moment. This Ethiopian man was now the first disciple of Jesus who'd received the gospel outside of Jerusalem and then Samaria, now Africa. We have an African believer here. The gospel is continuing to advance. How did this happen? God led Philip, and Philip followed God's leading. Philip had to have thought to himself, why, God, are you leading me out of this city where people are responding to the gospel, to a road that leads to the desert in the middle of nowhere? Yet he went. Why? Because of God's love for one man, this Ethiopian, and all the people who would hear the gospel through this one man. It's amazing. And God will lead us too, church. God will lead us. But sometimes we can get too focused on trying to figure out where is he leading me? Is he leading me there? Or maybe over here? Where should I be? Where, what am I supposed to be doing? I think more important than asking the question, God, where do you want me? is living with the confidence that God is leading you and he has been leading you. That's the truth. God is leading his people. He has been leading each one of us. The people in our life are not in our life accidentally or just coincidentally. He knows where each one of us in this room needs to be and he knows how to get us there. Our role is to be attuned as much as we can to this leading and being ready to love, ready to serve, and ready to share the good news of Jesus with the people that God brings into our life. When he brings them into our life with the knowledge that we have that he's been leading us, we aren't surprised. And we just keep on going, loving and serving and sharing the good news of Jesus, trusting that God has brought them near. Like Philip, we don't need to be obnoxious with a megaphone for the truth. We need spirit-empowered love. Spirit-empowered love that draws people out, like Philip did with this question, and manifests the message that we then proclaim. Love is what does that. Radical, outside-the-box, spirit-filled love. We need to trust God in this church. We need to trust that he has strategically positioned each one of us next to the people that we need to be near. It might not be on a desert road like it was for Philip. It might be in Peshtigo or Marinette or Ocano or the surrounding areas. 
It's where we work. It's where we live. It's where we shop for our groceries. These are the places where God has led us, and these are the places where he brings people near us. And we can trust that God has been working long before we ever show up. Just like he had been working long before Philip ever showed up in this Ethiopian man. He had this hunger for God. Philip had nothing to do with that. Philip just was at the right place to be able to share the good news by invitation. The story then ends in a pretty wild way. With the Spirit leading Philip by literally carrying him away (laughs) where Philip continues to share the good news all the way to Caesarea. The Spirit, it's just hard to imagine, the Spirit carries him to another location as they come up out of the water and the Ethiopian man just continues on his journey, rejoicing, of course, but what in the world? How did he get over the fact that Philip was just suddenly taken away? I was talking with Leslie about this part of the passage this week, and she had a really good insight I want to share. She said, this is an example of how we can always rejoice in what God is doing, but we don't need to always figure out what God is doing. It's true. We always want to know how and what and why. We want to understand what God is doing and explain what he is doing. And while we want to figure it out, And it's not bad to try to figure it out. We don't need to have it all figured out in order to rejoice and celebrate what he is doing among us. As we follow Jesus, there are going to be plenty of things that we can't explain and that we don't understand along the way. And that's okay. We can still rejoice and we can trust that God is working and he has really good reasons for what he's doing in our life. He's building his kingdom. He's gathering a people to himself bringing in more and more who the world is excluded into the inner circle of belonging in Christ. The good news of Jesus and his kingdom is for everyone who would respond to him in faith. And just like for them in Acts, God will continue to use for good what evil intends for harm. He continues to do that today. We can trust him to continue to grow and expand his kingdom among us communion. In communion, we celebrate and we savor our glorious inclusion in the body of Christ through his death on the cross for us. We come to him as his redeemed ones, full citizens of his unshakable kingdom, purchased with his body and blood. In the Lord's Supper, we remember and we celebrate and we anticipate Christ and his work in us his victory over death and darkness, and his someday return to set all things right. He really will do that. If you have responded to God's love with faith in Christ, we want to invite you to share, in, share with us in this Lord's Supper today, to take the bread and the cup. If you're visiting here this morning, if you're curious in checking things out, observing and learning, we're really glad you're here. We want to invite you to observe with us the way that we worship Jesus. Our communion table is open. It is for anyone who has trusted Jesus, whether or not you are a member here or not. We're together in this. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And we had broken it. He had given thanks and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Philip and for the Samaritans and for the Ethiopian man, 
for how you continue to show us that your kingdom will advance and that any opposition to it, you will use. Thank you for how you move the gospel forward that in Peshtigo, Wisconsin, in 2022, we would know who you are. This is part of that. You scattered your people. And Lord, we know that we continue to be scattered people. Would you continue to lead us by your Holy Spirit as we read today and empower us that the message we proclaim would have manifestation and reality? Would you draw more and more people in our midst to your Son? And Lord, help us to keep it about him. Guard us from making it about us. We love you. We thank you so much for the forgiveness of our sins, for the new life that we have, and for the Holy Spirit who lives in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.